Good evening, family. <coughs> Excuse me. Miley and I were privileged a couple of years ago to see David Crowder live in concert, and he sang that song, Oh How He Loves Us. And he told the story of how he was delivered that song. He didn't write that song, he made it famous. And he was given the song on a, on a cassette tape right before he got on a flight. And mid-flight, he remembered that this guy had given him this copy of this song. So he put on his headphones and he started listening to that song. And when the chorus came of, oh, how he loves us, the love of God fell on him in the middle of the plane, in the middle of the flight, and he started to weep and he couldn't stop weeping. And if you've ever had the love of God fall on you, I mean, it's, it's to infinity, it's amazing. It's always beyond your capacity to receive because his love is so incredible. But the weeping, he said, became uncontrollable. And then here comes the flight attendant. Sir, is everything okay? And he said, I was so, so drowned in the love of God, I couldn't even talk. And they thought I was having a seizure or something. <laughs> But he finally got, his, got it together and he shared with them, no, I'm listening to this song about God. And everybody went, oh, you know, one of those guys. <laughs> so I just thought it was a great story. And that song is so powerful. So, you know, things are so heavy in the world right now. I love, I love humor. I love to tell jokes. And so with your permission, I'd love to start tonight with a little, a little funny story, okay? A little girl went up to her father and she said, Daddy, how did the human race get here? And her father said, well, God made Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had babies, and their babies had babies, and their babies had babies, and we populated the planet. And the little girl went, oh, okay. And a couple days later, he went up, she went up to her mother and asked her mother the same question. Mommy, how did humans get here? And she said, well, many years ago, there were monkeys. And they evolved, and humans developed from the monkeys, and that's how we got here. So confused, the little girl returns to her father and she says, Daddy, how is it possible you, that you told me that humans got here because we were created by God and Mommy said that we came from monkeys? And the father looks at his little girl and he says, Honey, it's very simple. I told you about the origin of my side of the family. Your mother told you about her side. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so as you know, I'm not a pastor, <laughs> but I love to teach, and I love to teach about the Word of God, and you know what, I love to do Wednesday nights, I've been privileged to offer, to be able to do a lot of Wednesday night messages, and because you know who comes out on Wednesday nights is the people who really are seeking, knocking, and asking, and looking for a deeper personal relationship with our Creator, and so, you know, I love working with the Holy Spirit, creating these messages. It's like the most intimate time I have with the Spirit of God. So he gave me a really great message. At first, I'd like to just thank Dakota for that praise and worship tonight. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And the pastors, thank you for the privilege of being able to deliver the message. So the title of the message is, Where is Your Walk with Jesus? Okay. The subtitle is, Are You Going to Heaven? How do you know? Would you like to know that you know that you know? Are you worried that you could lose your salvation? If you've said the sinner's prayer, or what I like to call the believer's prayer, and allowed Jesus into your heart as your Lord and your personal Lord and Savior, something miraculous happens. This is a contract. This is an agreement that echoes throughout all of creation. And once you have confessed with your mouth and you believe with your heart and you say those words, it's a done deal. Now, we could invite probably six pastors on this side of the church and six on this side of the church, and these six would tell you, yes, you can lose your salvation. And these six would say, no, you can never lose your salvation. So tonight, hopefully, we're going to put that to rest. 
And because the Bible is really clear about this. The Bible's message is that God's word tells us there is no room for uncertainty on the theological side of this question. Okay, we have two sides of this question, the theological side and then the human side of the question. But what does the Bible tell us? In Romans 10, 13, the Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? In Mark 16, 16, Jesus himself said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Then in, and Kevin had this scripture up just last Sunday, John 10, 27 to 30. Jesus assures us that once we belong to him, there is no power in heaven or earth that can separate us from his redeeming love. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And then in 1 John 1, 9, the Apostle John tells us if we fall under conviction and become aware of the presence of sin in our lives, we need only confess it. We just need to repent. It's just, it's that easy. And when we do, God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the one scripture that really, really was like a revelation to me about this was in 2 Timothy 2.13 where Timothy said, we can have no possible cause to doubt him. For even when we are faithless, he remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. Think about that for a second. When we receive Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior, his righteousness, we, we, the trade that happens at the cross is so unfair in our favor. It's just remarkable. We trade him our sin and our filthy rags and all of our past history, and he gives us his righteousness. And that righteousness enters into us. And when that righteousness enters into us, when the Father looks at us, he looks in our heart, and what he sees is the righteousness of his Son. So even if you run away, I mean, think about this. Well, Sometimes yet we still doubt and we do foolish things and we fall into the world and we do things and we can get concerned that it's possible we could lose that relationship. And then we get into this fear of, oh my God, I may not make it. You know, I always joke, I hope God grades on a curve. You know, and I always say, I don't care if that gate hits me on the butt as it closes as long as I'm on the inside. You know, but then you, you think about the scriptures where it talks about the gate of heaven is closing and there's people outside and they see Jesus and they say, Jesus, don't close the gate on me. I spoke your name in the streets. I laid hands on people and healed them in your name. And he looked at them and said, I never knew you. He wants personal relationship. He's not interested in religion. He's interested in a one-on-one -on -one deep personal relationship with you, with you, with each one of us. And yet somehow we still doubt, okay? Why? Because we're whole people, we're bodies, we're soul, we're spirit, and spiritual troubles can affect your mind and your body. And here's the key, fear, doubt, and disbelief can affect your emotions. Okay, what are fear, doubt, and disbelief? The three main tools of the enemy. Okay, so even fear, doubt, and disbelief can set off episodes of mental and spiritual depression if you entertain the fear, doubt, and disbelief. Martin Luther, I found a quote by Martin Luther that addresses this beautifully. It says, all heaviness of mind and melancholy come from the devil, especially these thoughts that God is not gracious unto him, 
and that God will have no mercy upon him. That's, that's really where the enemy goes, to try and put a wedge in between you and your personal relationship and your belief, which is written in stone. Once you say that believer's prayer and allow him in, it's written in stone. So remember the tools of the enemy, fear, doubt, and disbelief. And don't buy into it. For myself, what I do, I have a saying, I refuse to fear what might happen. You know, if it's going to happen, it's on my door, then I'll deal with it. But there's like a hundred things you could worry and fear about that never, like 95 of them never happen. And the ones that do, we've got our church family, our pastors, our friends to deal with it. And when you think about it, you might have to deal with one or two of those things yourself. You know, let's turn that forward and, and live our lives in that way, where I'm not going to fear what might happen. Okay, so how else can we lose our salvation? Well, there's really only one way, and that's by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I don't know why. It's an interesting rule, but you can blaspheme the Father, you can blaspheme Jesus if you repent, <laughs> but you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, when I was researching this, I looked up the word blaspheme, and what came up on my computer was a website called blaspheme.com. I thought, wow, interesting. So I went there, and it was a website that was offering young people a free DVD or a free D CD of their choice if they would upload a short video of themselves blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And I thought, oh man, what a trick of the enemy. I thought nobody would fall for that. So I clicked to the page. Hundreds of videos had been uploaded. So I just prayed a prayer that God is merciful to those who are being deceived. Because that's a really evil deception. So tonight we're going to learn and understand one word. Okay, We're going to dig into one word tonight. And <clears throat> I thought I knew what that word meant. The word we're going to talk about is abide, A-B-I-D-E. What does abide mean? Does anybody know what abide means? Anybody? Ruth? To sit, okay. Anybody else? The word abide? We hear about living, abi abiding, abiding in, okay. Well, the Holy Spirit really inspired John, the Apostle John, to use the word abide in his uh, um, epistle. And John used the word over 50 times in his writings. And in the passage we're going to go over tonight, he used it 10 times. So let's open our Bibles, if you like, to John 15. And we're just going to, I'm going to read John 15, 1 through 11. And everybody knows this. This is the parable of the vine and how we're grafted into God through this vine. So I'll just read through this first once. I want you to pay attention to the word abide, okay? I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, 
that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Who would like to have their joy made full? I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing that we can have all this chaos in the world and yet sitting in the presence of God, we can simultaneously entertain the peace and even joy. But you can't do that if you have a worldly mind that's just caught up in the whirlwind of the media and the world. So most of us have already have heard that parable many times, but I really wanted to know what does this word abide mean? So before we do that, we're just going to break down those 11 uh, verses, and we're going to break it into three parts, our position, our practice, and our obedience. Okay, Verses 1 through, th through 3 talks about our position in the vine. I mean, this whole parable, part of the responsibility is God's, and part is ours. And these vines are being grafted together, like Nick taught us a few weeks ago in his message. The vine, there's a grafting that happens that's beautiful. And unless the, they bind and graft properly, the, the vine cannot produce the fruit. I mean, that's just what it says here. So, verses 1 through 3 pertain to our position. I am the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me, okay, that's our position, to be a branch in him. But then he goes on to say, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Through our seeking, knocking, and asking, and learning his word, we're being, made, we're being cleansed, we're being made clean in order to, to be able to be grafted in properly. The Father deals with the unfruitful branches. The disciples have already been cleansed. Okay, Verses 4 through 8 speak of our practice. Here the Lord tells us what we are to do as branches in him. This involves belief and dependence. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. That's what we are to do is bear fruit, which means any endeavor that we enter into with him and he empowers us and the Holy Spirit inspires us and he provides what we need, we will see things manifesting in the physical. We will see things in a positive manner, this force being allowed in our life through the life force of the, the vine into the branch that we are, okay? But we are to bear fruit. That is what we are supposed to do. And our, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So this whole equation is being set up to glorify God by us being uber successful and bearing fruit in whatever it is our endeavor is. Okay, and then verses 9 through 11 speak of our obedience. This is how we abide in Christ's love. He says, abide in my love. And then in, in 9, he says, abide in my love. Verse 10, abide in my love. Uh, abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. So our Obedience is just to abide, okay? It's not like we have to do anything besides get fully grafted, believe, and then be obedient to abide. So let's get back to this word abide. Abiding is believing in, depending on, and persevering with the name power, and authority of Jesus Christ. There are benefits to abiding. If the word abides in you, you can be confident of receiving answers to your prayers, for you will be praying according to the will of God. By abiding in Christ, we are caused to bear fruit, which brings glory to the Father and thereby demonstrates our discipleship. Abiding in Christ by obeying his commands changes our relationship from that of slaves to sin to friends of God. 
being a friend of God puts you in an interesting place because it's in that inner circle of friends where God makes his secrets known. The abiding in the obedience results in an intimacy which cannot be experienced in any other way. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. Okay, so I have a handout that I'm going to give tonight, but before we hand it out, I just want to say something. When I first compiled this list, it's been an ongoing compilation for a while, it really convicted me and it challenged me in my walk with Jesus. I felt like I could go deeper when I saw this list. And because it shows the depth of a true, of the true personal relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. So let's go ahead and pass them out. Um, how many people know of words that have more than one meaning? Everybody. How many know words that have maybe five meanings? Say 10 meanings? Now we're getting low. How many words have 20 meanings? Well, the word abide has 25 meanings. And they're verbs. They're all verbs. <laughs> they're action words. And if you look at really abiding in Jesus, and my suggestion is take this handout home, put it on your fridge, put it on your wall, and don't let it overwhelm you. Just pick out a new one, maybe one that you hadn't really been, hadn't thought of before, and just practice it for the day. It's all about, you know, deepening the personal relationship and abiding with Jesus. And tonight's not going to be a long, a long message. I do want to read something more that I think really puts a cherry on the top of the Sunday here. And it's John 3, 15 to 21. Most everybody knows John 3, 16. But in order that everyone, and this is the amp from Amplified Version, and it has lots of little parentheses around other words, descriptive words. So I'll read all of those descriptions as I go. In order that everyone who believes in him, who cleaves to him, trusts him and relies on him, may not perish, but have eternal life and actually live forever. Okay, that's John 3.15. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, so that whoever believes and trusts in and clings on and relies on him shall not perish, shall not come to destruction, shall not be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. For God did not send the son into the world in order to judge, to reject or condemn, to pass sentence on the world but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. For him there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, does not cleave to, rely on or trust in Jesus is judged already. He has already been convicted and has already received his sentence because he has not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. The basis of the judgment, the indictment, the test by which we are judged the ground for the sentence lies in this. The light has come into the world, and people have loved the darkness rather than and more than the light, and their works, their deeds, are evil. For every wrongdoer hates, loathes, detests the light, 
and will not come out into the light and shrink from it, lest his works, his deeds, his activities, his conduct be exposed and reproved. But he who practices truth, who does what is right, comes out into the light so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are, wrought with God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, in dependence upon him. And I'd like to close with a a short prayer. This is from Esther, the book of Esther. And now I would commend you to seek this Jesus of whom the prophets and apostles have written that the grace of God of the of God the Father and also of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost which beareth record of them may be and abide in you forever amen thank you